So uh, yeah, I tried to come up with a sexier title for this other than just a practical approach. But uh, every draft I sent to Seth got laughed out for using uh, overuse of buzzwords. It's entirely possible I used like, the word synergy, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so I'll stick with the basics. And uh, Seth mentioned I'm nervous. And that's because this is really my first talk, uh, especially one of this size and scope. So if I seem a little nervous, it's because I'm actually very nervous. And it's masked by a good, vene a good veneer of terror. <clears throat> but I'll cheat, and I'll give you the punchline of this entire talk right off the bat. Bro's a fairly complex tool. But it does come with this Turing complete scripting language through which you can interface with everything Bro's doing for you behind the scenes. And the good news is you can really reach a decent level of competency with Bro scripting in about a weekend if you approach it in a systematic fashion. Uh, much of my talk is based on the fact that there's not really too much out there about a systematic fashion for learning it. So uh, as you can tell, also, I'm going to be giving my presentation in Emacs. Uh, <laughs> Primarily for two reasons. Uh, I make truly awful presentation slides. And I'll save myself from that embarrassment and you that pain. But primarily because I'm going to be swapping back and forth between generating some script output, visiting some files. And this should make it a little more smooth. Uh, I won't have to swap back and forth between applications. Uh, so like Seth said, I work out of Alexandria, Virginia. I'm a systems network and security engineer out there uh, for a very small consulting company. And I have to wear a lot of hats in my job. And the hat that's growing the biggest and the fastest is network security monitoring. And things like Security Onion and Bro are great for me because with the added uh, responsibilities did not come added budget and added time in the day. Uh, I also am a developer on Security Onion under Doug. Uh, but it should be made clear, and this is why I put it in quotes, uh, Security Onion is Doug's baby. Uh, I babysit from time to time, but he really is the brains and the drive behind that project. But in working with Security Onion, a lot of times we talk about Bro. It's one of the biggest topics we tend to discuss, both in how to integrate with Security Onion and what to do in network security monitoring with Bro and intrusion, uh, sorry, incident response. And it seemed like every conversation ended with the phrase, I really need to spend some time learning Bro scripting language. And so that's kind of the impetus of what pushed me through to start taking a look at this. I'm a fairly new Bro user. Uh, I discovered Bro, or was introduced to Bro, through Richard Baitlick's TCP weapons class, which was last year, uh, right before the 2011 Bro workshop. So in, by no means am I a long and a tooth Bro, develop, or Bro user. Certainly not a Bro developer. <laughs> uh, but I got pretty frustrated. I would spend time looking through docu doc online documentation, trying to find anything online about how to go about just learning bro scripting, any kind of approach. And at some point, I'm fairly sure I've just flat out begged Seth for this fabled bro book that they have. And he just shut me down. He's like, no, you, you can't see that. <laughs> so I got pretty petulant and a little obstinate and decided, fine, I'm going to document my approach to learning bro. I'm going to try to learn it on my own by hook or by crook. And hopefully, the next person who comes along with this problem will be able to find these and work along with it. So like, Bro, like uh, Seth said, I ended up writing a series of blog posts in a very stream of consciousness manner. What I wanted to document was not so much where I went right, but where I went wrong and how I reworked back to getting to an objective. What I would generally do is pick some kind of goal to solve with Bro scripting and try to work through that way. And Seth acted basically as my editor. He would kind of gently nudge me towards the right answer on some things without outright telling me. And so he got to see a lot of rough drafts, got to get a lot of repetitive questions. And I think it causes him just a teeny bit of mental anguish to watch someone clumsily stumble around bro and just not get it right off the bat. So this is possibly a little bit of his revenge making me stand up and talk in front of you. Uh, thankfully, he took a little bit of pity, and I've got the pre-lunch spot, which is a prime spot. I can go short. <clears throat> So if anybody recognizes Arthur C. Clarke's third law of prediction, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And if you've come new to Bro, you know that this is exactly what Bro and Bro scripting looks like. It's, it, Bro is this master at hand waving. It lulls you into thinking packets go in one end, and these great logs come out the other. And who cares what goes on behind the scenes? But the fact that there's this scripting language that helps you unearth what's going on, this kind of underlying body of Bro, is was pretty exciting for me. <clears throat> so because Bro ships with this large set of default scripts, it kind of acts as its own semi-self-documenting process. The, uh, I'm talking right into this. <laughs> so 
in my opinion, uh, Bro is Bro and Network Security Monitoring are kind of like this multi-tentacled elder god, and our <laughs> <laughs> and Bro scripting is how we're going to communicate with that. So you can think of it as you know, Bro and Network Security Monitoring are your Cthulhu, and we're all France and Thir Francis Thurston, and Bro scripting is our Necronomicon. And I just made a <laughs> HP Lovecraft joke in front of a bunch of smart people. <laughs> so. I don't particularly feel my experience is uncommon. I feel a lot of people probably come into this process and maybe hit the same walls I did. Um, for example, I would see uh, like Justin Azoff or even uh, Liam posting on like Reddit about Bro, and it, you know I see code snippets posted, and it was just like watching a, a wizard perform a trick without context. It was really difficult to understand, and it took me a while to figure out that there's kind of a perspective problem. I worked a lot with Seth, and Seth's been using Bro for like, I think, seven years now. And he's fairly intrinsically uh, related to Bro, and it's hard for him to see it in the point of view of a newbie. It's hard to kind of guide how you're going to go through that. It's been a long time since I had to think in that way. So when I uh, started poking around Bro, what I found was that it has this incredibly well documented scripting language. And not only is it well documented, it's also lends itself well to experimentation. So for example, you'll find these uh, built-in function definition files. Uh, on a default installation through source, it's in user local bro share bro base. And each one has concise, clear explanations of what each definition is doing. As well, they cross-reference related functions, related events. And it's an incredible resource to use. So I'll just run down. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly trying to point out the process of learning Bro. I'm not really trying to teach anyone here how to use Bro, uh, probably because I'd be a bad teacher. Uh, Event.bif.bro is going to be the events generated by Bro's core, and it's a fairly high-level uh, view of it. Strings.bif.bro is your strings, string manipulation and uh, processing functions. Bro.bif.bro is kind of hard to define. It seems to be kind of a catch-all. There's a lot of various functions inside that. Reporter.bif.bro is going to be notice generation and the like. Uh, Types.bif.bro and logging.bif.bro aren't entirely well documented, and I haven't really found a use for them, which isn't to say there's not a use for them. But uh, if you spend time looking at these, you start to learn fairly fast. And not only are they well documented, they're uniformly documented, which means you can use common Unix tool chains to be able to pull any kind of documentation out of it if you just happen to know the pattern. And from there, any HTTP event that just has the keyword HTTP. And same for a concatenation uh, function in strings and a time function in bro.bif.bro. As well, this makes it incredibly easy to write tools to do this kind of thing. Uh, I wrote a major mode for Emacs called bro mode, and it was trivial to do this. And uh, Emacs uses Emacs Lisp to extend it. I don't know what Vim uses. I'd like to see someone use uh, extend it in Vim. Uh, I'd say Matthias should do it, because he always uh, rags on. Emacs users. <sighs> so I kind of want to give a lightning round introduction of kind of what, what everybody, what a new user would need to start working in Bro scripting. Uh, I hate to do this. Show of hands, who has written a production Bro script? Something that, actually, if you're a Bro dev, put your hand down. <laughs> so a, a good number of you, but hopefully some of you will be able to use this talk to start learning on your own because it's, it really does extend the functionality of Bro and you start to kind of bleed down to what you need with your network. Uh, bro scripting manages to stay fairly recognizable if you have a basic understanding of programming or scripting language, not even a high level understanding. Uh, I've got a CS degree, and usually I can muddle my way through a scripting language or programming language and get what I want out of it, get a foothold, and get my job done. Bro, it was a little more difficult for this. Uh, it just really gave me nothing. Um, until I really started just using Bro to learn Bro. Uh, and I think really anyone can do that. And if you don't have a background in programming, there's a lot of uh, online tools like Codecademy, Coursera, stuff like that, that can teach you fairly quickly. And Bro scripting, Bro scripting language really isn't too complex. It does a really good job of not letting you shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, unfortunately, you can shoot yourself in the foot, uh, especially if you start trying to do packet level uh, analysis, which the documentation really tells you not to do. So you, you do need a fairly small subset of skills to start this process. And one of the primary ones is to be able to work through the connection record data type. The connection record data type is 
passed to a massive amount of events in events.biff.bro. Out of the 325 events, I believe 262 take it as a uh, argument. So having some kind of understanding of it is really going to do you some good. As well, going through the in file or online documentation is a particular use. It will mostly carry state your state for your connections. It's a lot of nested data structures, and it's mutable. Uh, the first time I ran into this, one of my blog posts covered uh, detecting base 64 auth. And I thought it was pretty clever because the script would then decrypt it using the built-in base 64 decoder in Bro. And I think it was actually Matthias and IRC was like, well, you know, you know what you could do is you could just alter the connection record to tell it to automatically decode that password. And I was like, son of a bitch, I can't believe it can do that. Because <laughs> Bro can turn on password. Uh, uh, if it can decrypt it, it'll, it can turn it on but you have to do it manually. This can be finely grained on a connection, uh, a connection by connection basis if you were to do something like this. So if you don't know, Bro's dereference operator is the dollar sign. A lot of languages will use the dot. Bro can't use the dot because of native data types for IP addresses and domain names, which would make that fairly horrible, honestly. So since you're going to be looking at it, print and format are going to become your two new best friends. Print, I'm not going to cover. Anyone in this room probably knows what a print statement does. Format is rows printf. And it will take as its argument a formatting string to explain how uh, the following uh, argument should be displayed. So something like this, I'll just replace that variable and welcome to bro exchange. And it's fairly easy. But to get into a little bit more complex, one uh, I brought along the PCAP they gave out in the workshop for uh, I browsed that PCAP on the 2011 workshop. I know it has HTTP information in it. Uh, so as just a basic example, going through and say pulling HTTP headers, you want to see maybe the refer and build something for that. And it turns out to be fairly easy. My uh, window's not fully there, is it? So again, uh, you can start with just searching through events.bro, and I'm going to be working through the Emacs bro mode. All this is replicatable with the uh, Unix tool chain, with grep, with sed, and awk. But if we wanted to find anything, since we know we're going to be looking for uh, HTTP headers, and HTTP headers stands out from there. And we'll just dump C straight to the uh, output. And it's kind of a dog's breakfast. Uh, <laughs> it, it is fairly hard to uh, see. The more you look at it, the more it will start making more sense. Every open and closing bracket is a, a nested data type. So right there, you can see we've got our ID which would be the connection ID record, and orig and respond. And if you don't know, most of you probably do, Bro uses originator and responder instead of host and server, because Bro is connection oriented instead of packet oriented. But if we wanted to give the originator responder, just work backwards. You've got uh, seed ID dollar sign orig h. And we can just start uh, seeing what we can see from there. I don't know why I'm looking up there. Name and value are passed into the HTTP header event. Uh, it will be just the name of the header and the value of the header. Oh. And from there, we can see our originator, our responder, and every HTTP header built in there. And from here, you can do just about anything you want header related base. Uh, like I said, there's, you, it's easy to find uh, a client using base64. Uh, Doug's example of uh, hostile user agents, you can pull that out of there. Primarily just because Bro lets you. It's got a uh, flex-based regex, I think. So let's pull a refer. And we have just our refers. And you can use this to start adding intelligence-based logic to your script, and you've got my first bro script. And you know, I, you've got things like, I think Zeus used a, uh, an empty uh, refer, uh, like I said, finding hostile user agents. 
And from here, you can just start extending, start adding intelligence based on your own network, what you want to see and what you want to try to detect. So I wanted to include a practical example here. And the, uh, if Eric Kelmvik had a post up on NetResec about a new module added to Metasploit to perform a WPAD man in the middle attack. And it's a great post. If you haven't seen it, I really suggest you read it. It's a really old attack, but just got recently added to Metasploit. And given that it was just recently added, I wouldn't be surprised to start seeing it on internal pen tests. It's low-hanging fruit, and it's something that should be looked for anyway. But a quick rundown, he gives us this great information of what WPAD does, and it goes on to tell us what uh, you can use in T-Shark. T-Shark is my favorite tool of all time. I love it. Uh, unfortunately, T-Shark is not deployable. You can run this against PCAP, you can run it against live traffic, but you can't deploy it across an enterprise and expect to be effective. So a quick rundown of, P of uh, WPAD. It's going to search its DHCP lease for option 252 and use that as a uh, use the address in there for its proxy. Uh, if that fails, it's going to issue a DNS request for WPAD. If that fails, it's going to broadcast NetBIOS request for WPAD, which is where the attack comes in place, because there's no authentication for that. Anything can pretty much respond. And that's what Metasploit does. It gives it a false uh, address, and then using Metasploit and something like the burp suite, you're now passing traffic for that uh, victim as a proxy. So I tend to start a lot of my scripts with T-Shark. Surprisingly, I've been finding that the more I do this, the more I'm able to start bleeding T-Shark out of my uh, workflow. I start to just start with Bro and just start going through the process of finding what I need. And uh, if you're interested, oops. So there's the NetBIOS request and the NetBIOS response. Uh, just pulled out of uh, T-Shark. If you haven't used T-Shark, the dash R flag is exactly what it's looking for. And a great example of being embarrassed by Bro uh, the last, that set of hex there at the end, I didn't know what that was. And when uh, I was writing the slide, I was like, if I don't know what that is, someone's going to ask. So I spent an afternoon going through the NetBIOS uh, RFC and the WPAD documentation, and it's just a uh, name encoding. Uh, it's, I think uh, NetBIOS names are like 16 bytes. They get spread to 32 and uses a, like OSCE bi or a, a biased encoding format. And so I wrote a, a script to check my logic, uh, just a Ruby script. And I was telling Seth about it. I was like, yeah, you know, I, I got this working. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's right. And Seth goes, oh, yeah, that's decode underscore NetBIOS name. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. He's like, yeah, we do that already. I'm like, son of a I was just wasted an afternoon. So Eric's post gives us a great amount of information. We get to choose, from, choose how we want to start our process. And, uh, what I would generally start with, I'd start with a NetBIOS query. NetBIOS queries are fairly easy to detect if your sensor has uh, broadcast visibility. And we can actually detect the WPAD file, WPAD.dat file being passed to the victim. <clears throat> so the process would generally be start looking through events.bif.bro, find events related to what we want to see, and dump C, and then bleed it down to usable data. Once you have usable data, you get to start deciding how you want to react. Do you want to push a log file? Do you want to generate a log file, or do you want to emit a notice? And in this case, both are appropriate. And in my opinion, I think you should probably, if, if you're new to it, you should learn log file production from the online documentation. Because there's a couple of steps that have to fall into place before you can write to a log file. And the online documentation is one of the examples that I found that was perfect for new users, because it does include a great uh, just how to generate logs, a great example, and a great uh, set of scripts. Notices are fairly easy. It's two pieces. You just have to enumerate the notice type and a call to notice. And for this, I do suggest looking through source code. You should absolutely start looking through and seeing how people do this. And one of the biggest reasons for this is because, again, you're going to be exposed to idiomatic bro. And having that exposure is incredibly useful. And this was really my, uh, my first example of this. Uh, I was looking through the, this is the interesting names heuristic for SSH. And if you see here, uh, it's an, a call to notice, and the message is what's going to be in our notice. But there, you can see that he's using format to go against these two ternary operators. And this is going to give a clear and concise message and not waste anybody's time. And it's a parlor trick. But it's a parlor trick you should kind of put in your hat and use, because it's idiomatic. It's, it's fantastically written to stay maintainable. This is readable. Instead of having to have, say, a, you know, a chain of if statements or something like that, you've got a nice, clear example.
So again, we can start with our initial testing and output for our, uh, the entire process here. And we can go with just generating a notice if we happen to see a, a NetBIOS request for WPAD. And uh, so always good to give your script a namespace. That did not work like I wanted it to. And I tend to snip it out, uh, anything that is formulaic, anything that you might not need to memorize. This is just enumerating the notice type to include uh, WPAD query. And then we can start looking for anything that's going to use uh, a NetBIOS, uh, basically use a NetBIOS query. And Bro folds NetBIOS queries into DNS. So we'll just start looking for DNS. And there's quite a few, and DNS request is likely going to be our best bet for it. And again, just dump C. Oops. And again, a little bit of a dog's breakfast for ID, but you can start using this and just search through for anything with WPAD. And you can see it's there in query, which is part of DNS, which is going to be just part of the connection record. So C dollar sign DNS query. So if you use a pretty much the exact same kind of thing I uh, showed in the header example, if WPAD and C DNS query. And if you give it some kind of handy message, uh, some of these, like sub, aren't required. You do want to pass your uh, connection record back to the notice framework. And we're going to use an identifier of the originator's host and uh, port to act kind of as a unique identifier. And we're going to suppress it for a day. So we'll see this host generate any kind of WPAD request once per day per port. And oh, I, uh, missing one where? Oh, shit. No, yeah, thanks. I should probably stop swearing on camera, right? Fantastic, Scott. <laughs> Sorry? Someone said dollar note. Yeah. Anyway, when this runs, it would have run a notice. It would have given us absolutely no output, which means this is deployable uh, when, it, when it works. And I actually find which bug I introduced there. But, Matthias? Oh, I, uh, there you go. You're right. Awesome. And I just used one there, naturally. <laughs> so what we can find here is our notice.log, and it has the notice we have here. And, you, and you've got something, you, again, you can work through, add your intelligence, and start working, uh, basically, go to lunch. Let bro start detecting this for you. And since there's more information to be given, and I'll spare you live coding that, given my nerves, uh, we can extend. We can start generating a log for every NetBIOS request. You probably don't want a notice every time your uh, every time a client just uh, checks for WPAD because you might have it forwarded to email. We'll dump that to a log file, and we'll generate the notice if we see WPAD.dat being passed through. Uh, Bro can do signature uh, detection, and it's fairly easy. I don't believe it's used too much, but uh, you can see. That's the signature for detecting the WPAD.dat, that find proxy for URL. And oh. 
As you see, I marked here the logging framework just to prove a previous point. There are a couple things that do need to fall in place and, again, go through the online documentation, which I think is called uh, customizing bros log files. But here you can see um, bro init will uh, define our logging stream, our DNS request here. We can uh, just pass into the log file our information record, we, our info record we start up top. and. If the signature is detected, it's going to give us a, uh, a notice. And we can just give it the exact same thing. And you can see wpad.log. But fairly close, uh, fairly easy examples. And this is almost Bro acting as its own self-documenting system. And I definitely suggest that anyone should use it. And so just to close, we have multiple sources for learning Bro. Unfortunately, there's no full-on how to write your first Bro script. Uh, the Bro cheat sheet is a fantastic resource. I don't know who authored it, but it's really fantastic. It's definitely one of those documents. I'm going to just keep, I should just have Matias give talks. Uh, it's one of those documents you should probably just leave up while you're learning so you can cross-reference. Uh, the mailing list is very active, and it's full of people who love to help. Bro IDS on Freenode, you can usually catch people on there who are willing to give you a hand. And the default Bro scripts. Spend time just looking through, finding what you can, and, finding what you can and start. Uh, Matthias? No, please do. Please do. <laughs> Online documentation is fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's run off of Sphinx, and it, it uses pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, the documentation that is in the files that you'd be searching through. Proxygen. Proxygen. Yes. That's easy to remember. Uh, what I tend to do is when I'm, when I'm starting to write bro scripting, I kind of have this niggling thought of, this is kind of a stupid idea. But stupid things can work. You can put something in place, and you can start finding things. Uh, if you just Put in place, watch your notices, watch your logs. A lot of notices tend to start as anomalies noticed in, you know, noticed in logs and pushed into uh, like actual notices that you want short, uh, a short turnaround of time. As well, if it doesn't hit 100%, that's not bad. If you can have a decently high success rate, you can get a return out of this. Uh, as well, as, as Bro is growing, you know, we already have the input framework in 2.1, the file analysis framework is coming, an intelligence framework is coming. We're going to get more tools. Yeah, I, I see Robin grinning. Uh, we're going to get more tools and more, uh, more uh, ability to detect at a higher percentage. And as long as that documentation stays uniform, stays uh, fairly robust, then you can keep doing this somewhat organic and directed approach to learning Bro. Primarily, I think the best thing that can happen to Bro, aside from perpetual funding, would be for people to discover Bro and quickly move into writing Bro scripts. The, the larger base we have of people writing bro scripts, the better, in my opinion. So that would wrap it up for me. If 